if somebody's stealing your signs, change your signs. Guys do it all the time, you know, and part of the game. Yeah. I mean, and, and as a catcher, 20, 30 years ago, if you struck out 100, 125 times, you were not in the big leagues. Nope. <laughs> I go, until then, I'm going to be paying my own bills. And I know you're not going to pay my bills. You sit back there and you just set up and you catch it and I'll try to hit my spot. And then he just looked at me. He's like, all right, we'll run it like that. <laughs> Again, it's it's a lot going on up here in this game. And I yeah. think you've made so many wonderful points today about the simplicity and keeping things simple. I it took a lot for me to go and sit next to guys like Arthur Rhodes and Darren Oliver and these older guys that have been around for 20 years. But I asked them questions. They didn't just open the book. Transitioning from professional baseball to the rest of your, your life. How was leaving baseball, transitioning out of baseball, and what have you been up to since then? Out to center. This is Kratz. It's way back. It is gone! Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today we have on Jamie Moyer, Tom Lampkin, and Mark Lowe. We talked through a lot of different baseball topics, a lot of different mindset topics around the sport and life itself. Hope you enjoy this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe and let's get into it. This podcast is sponsored by Black Label Supplements. They're my go-to for all things supplementation, whether it's pre-workout, post-workout, creatine, BCAAs, you name it. Go check out blacklabelsupplements.com. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM. My full-time career is as a mortgage broker, assisting clients with their mortgage financing needs because every sports fan needs to find a living room of their own to watch their favorite team on their big screen. You can visit brokerconnorweb.com or my contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Sweet. Well, yeah, thank you all for coming on, taking the time. I know you got busy schedules, your own stuff going on. I think it would just be a really cool setting to have you all on together to reminisce, talk baseball both past day and, and current. I know I've had each of you on the podcast separately to help share your story, but to have everyone in the room, I think is really cool. So thank you all. Um, I think it'd be cool to start by just going around briefly, just saying who you are, kind of your experience in the league, and then kind of get into it. You want to go first, Jamie? It's going to take the longest. Uh, I'll make it short and sweet. <laughs> Jamie Moyer, I uh, played for a few teams, signed in 84 uh, with the Cubs, finished in 2012 with the Rockies. In between there, there were several teams. Uh, I have a teammate sitting across from me, Mr. Lampkin. Uh, boy, we crossed paths just yeah. a short bit. Yeah. Uh, my time in Seattle with Mr. Mr. Lowe here, um, playing as long as I have. I probably have forgotten more teammates than I realized that I played with. So, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah, um, I was... My name is Mark Lowe, uh, drafted in 04, got called up in 2006 with Seattle, played with Jamie that year, and I believe 2007. No, and I wasn't there. You were Just 06. 06. Yeah, Just 06. 06. 06. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was with them and for about five years, traded to Texas and all over the map after that, Texas, Anaheim, Cleveland, Detroit, Toronto, back to Seattle three different times. So... Um, my last year was 2017 and actually 19 in indie ball was my last year. Awesome. My name's Tom Lampkin. I, uh, was drafted in 86, uh, played for six different clubs, um, retired after the O two 2 season, um, uh, spent three years with Jamie in Seattle and some, some pretty good teams, uh, for the Mariners. And then, um, played with some played with some Hall of Famers, played with some some great players uh, on some good teams, really good teams and uh I mean I couldn't ask for for a better career. Played played for um played for some great managers, some great guys and I get to, you know, meet guys now after the game that that played after me like Mark and there's there's some other guys around this area that I've got a chance to to spend some time with. So so baseball was good. It was uh, it was they were good years, good years of my life. Yeah, let's start with just the overlap that everyone has and your, you guys playing together in Seattle and then also your experience from the outside, experiencing what that was like. Your, your, your guys' time in Seattle together, you want to talk through kind of... Well, your... I wasn't... I didn't play with Mark. Right. It was Jamie and, and... Yeah, yeah. I came in in 99 to Seattle 
uh, right before they imploded the kingdom. I, I, and were you there in 98? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I, I kind of came in when Jamie was there. Um, and I mean, we got to be friends immediately cause, cause you know, he was a pitcher and I was a catcher. So we, we could spend a lot of time together and they were great years. I mean, we had, we, we won those years and we, we set a record one year and, um, <clears throat> then we got to, we got to open Safeco field, which was really cool and great place to play. Um, I, I, I wish I got a chance to play with Mark, but, um, my career had ended by then and we were close. We were close. What was your last year? Oh, two was my last season. Okay. Yeah. But, and I followed him a little bit after that. And especially the guys that were from here, you know, I, I kept up with, but, um, but I was fortunate to, to be able to catch Jamie. And I mean, um, you know, there, there, I get a lot of questions, you know, people ask me about favorite managers and, you know, who'd you like to hit off and, you know, who do who was your favorite pitcher? And, you know, I always remember, you know, saying how much I enjoyed catching Jamie because he, he threw, he, he threw the ball where he wanted to throw it. And I knew what it was going to do. You know, the, the guys that are tough to catch are, are guys that you don't know what their balls are going to do. And, and the one thing I really loved about Jamie was, was his consistency and his command. And it was, uh, those, those were fun years. I and mean, we had, we had some great years together. I wish I would have, Got to play with Mark, but it didn't happen. Well, we came up with a, a great set of signs too. We did um, that. I I think really helped me a lot because even after I left the Mariners, um, you know, there's always you know in baseball there's always sign stealing. You know, it's part of the game, right? And uh, Tom came up with touches on his on his body, and uh, we actually turned it into a touch was a pitch and a location. So he never had to give any kind of location. Oh. So it was, it was kind of special um, because, you know, I, th I basically, I didn't throw hard and I was a, a, a two seamer kind of guy and a changeup guy. So I threw those pitches, you know, and, and say in 110 pitch outing, 115 pitch outing, I probably threw 60 to 70 fastballs and probably 25 30 35 depending on the team change-ups so we use those pitches a lot which would you know when you're given signs it, if you're using utilizing it you're going to give something away so we ended up in our sign sequencing we had two signs for each of those pitches so we didn't have to go back to the same spot mm -hmm. and then we could change up you know second sign third sign last sign whatever it might be so it, it got to be really creative. And, it, you know, like you said, when I moved on to the Phillies, I took that with me. And, uh, we, you know, I had some teammates that were always, like, concerned they're stealing your signs, you're stealing your signs. And I'm like, I didn't yeah, really feel like anybody was stealing my no, signs. No, I, I think the reason is is because, you know, I mean, typically, it, and, and, I mean, you played later than I did, but, you know, one's a fastball, two's a curveball, three's a slider, mm -hmm. you know, wiggle, four's a change. Well, they didn't know what a change was. They didn't know they didn't know what on the body was a change. Right. You know, we could We could – we could do we could touch anything we wanted just say it's the third place i touch and you know they wouldn't know what touch was was a change so it wasn't but fingers at all wasn't at fingers all. at all wow. okay. yeah yeah so we knew where it was and we knew where it was going and that's right. that's the only thing that we need to know so you know it was impossible and it's like we talked about before you know and, and i don't know if these guys have a different take on it but if somebody's stealing your signs change your signs yeah you know, I, I don't i don't they, they, guys do it all the time you know, and that part of the game. Yeah. I mean, and, and as a catcher, that was my job. I mean, I, I'm watching the set guy on second. I'm listening for the dugout. I mean, it wasn't just guys beating on garbage cans. It's first base coaches trying to get yeah. a peek. It's guys saying their names or numbers, a nickname. A, there's all kinds of stuff they can do to relay signs. And that's fine. That's, I have no problem with that. I'm just going to change my signs up. And we, we had another system, which you probably remember, where – I would throw the ball back to him and then touch a part of my body to change the next yeah. pitch. And it wouldn't even, nobody would know. Nobody would know if they weren't, if they weren't specifically watching. And then Jamie would turn around and touch his hat. And then I knew he got, he got that we changed right. the signs and I could just give three signs and nobody would ever know what they are. So there's ways to get around it. And and I'm not saying that what they did wasn't illegal. I, I'm not really privy to exactly what happened, but if somebody's doing something against the law, I get it. Then, you know, if it's against the law, then they should be punished for it. But 
I, I'm the first person I'm looking at if somebody stealing signs is me. And what can I do to change that? And we did. We, we came up with some great systems. I even got to a point with, not with Tom, but with some other catchers that we might have struggled with signs. I'd say, throw me back the pitch that you're thinking about calling. You see the so ball So you moving. could see just, the, you know, they didn't have to throw it hard, but yeah. just the different spin. And I could I could catch the ball and shake my head, yes or no. Or <laughs> the other, amazing. the other, if it's I like was. like 4D chess. chess that's not hackers. Yeah. yeah. The other, yeah. the other one was if, if, uh, you know, if I'm thinking away, let's say there's a right hand a hitter, I'd catch the ball this way. If I'm thinking in, <laughs> I'd try to catch the ball this way. Right. So now I, you know, we were struggling as pitcher catcher. And, you know, as we, we all know that the, the being able to keep the pace of the, the tempo of the game going, yeah. you want to keep and when you're yeah. shaking, 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 you know, you know, now all of a sudden everything slows down. So that was one way for me to try to combat that with, you know, I mean, uh, one of my last couple of years in Seattle, I think we went through seven catchers during the course of the season. So that wasn't easy either. I mean, we had a Japanese catcher, Danny Wilson got hurt. Uh, we had a couple of young guys. We had a couple of veterans, but nobody, you know, and they're coming to the big leagues and they're expected to be right. the guy, you know, do your job immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, you have no experience with each other. So, you know, you try to work around things and make things work. That's Pitchcom before Pitchcom was ever a thing. You know, yeah, now they press buttons for yeah, location. But, and, and then when it gets loud, you can't hear. You got all, you know, right. to me, that's, it, again, it's to me, that's just another distraction because that, you know, I, I'm sure Mark can, you know, expand on this, that, you know, when you're, when you're looking down that lane or looking to home plate, that's first and foremost, and you have a task and it's throwing a strike and being aggressive and attacking the zone. Right. Now, all of a sudden, when you have those distractions that come into play, all of a sudden you might lose your sharpness or your effectiveness. Totally agree. Um, I was, I could never have dictated what I was going to throw before the ball came back. So that's impressive. <laughs> I, I, my routine was get the ball, kind of get to the back of the rubber as I'm thinking, and then kind of visualize that last pitch and what I could kind of use mm -hmm. for the next one based off the swing. If he was late, it was easy. I could do it on right. that one. Um, but I needed that second just to kind of gather Yep. regroup breathe i was a big breather just making sure that i was calm and comfortable and well my thought behind it was if i can add or delete something yeah to make his job easier and call in pitches for sure you know we're working together and you even had signals so if there was like a, a scuff mark on a ball then you would signal to the catcher i think that's what you had said that yeah hey this ball is gonna have more movement on it yeah there were there were guys that i played with in my career that that would give me a sign that there was a scuff on it, or I would give them a sign that there was a scuff on it. <clears throat> Just, I'm mean, not that they wouldn't see it. Most pitchers, when they caught the ball, they looked at the ball anyway. You know, a lot of them that you you couldn't feel it, but you could see it. But now, later in my career, they the umpires throw out, they yeah, well, throw out it, anything that. Right, but it, it, I also be, felt like in the end of my career, is a lot. A guy get a scuff ball, but I could go, oh my god, I don't know what to do with it. Throw it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, to me, you get a couple scuff balls when you're practicing or you're throwing in the bullpen and you try to figure out what That's it can right. and can't do. Yeah. And then you have to trust whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. Look, if, if it's scuffed naturally, it's scuffed naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, utilize it. it yeah. It's a tool. That's right. right? Yeah. Yep. You yeah. know, but I, I play with a lot of guys. When I was with the Phillies, a lot of younger pitchers were like, uh-uh, getting rid of it. I'm like, you're crazy. Yeah. What you're about crazy. the ones you got back that were lopsided because they – Hit him so hard. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's probably every other one that, <laughs> that I got back. I always had to get rid of those. You know, I don't. I don't know that lopsided helped me. I mean, yeah, no, I didn't have the, enough velocity. Well, yeah. maybe I don't know. I feel like when they hit it, they hit it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So across the league, like you guys all played on different teams. You're talking about having the signals between each other. Was there any sort of standard? practice between catchers and pitchers for signals or was it just you two that decided to come up with this you're talking to each other through taps or was were other teams doing that i don't recall anybody doing it before we came up with it i, I mean it could be wrong but i don't recall that let's say you came up with it yeah uh, i never saw that yeah. um but one of the reasons that that happened like like jamie said was it was easier to to mask our his fastball which you know, if he so he threw a four seamer and a two seamer and a cut fastball. So he actually had three fastballs. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're correct. Um, and so 
the cutter could be thrown inside or outside and the the same same with the with the two with the two seamer and the four seamer so so essentially he had six fastballs mm -hmm. okay and so we had to have a sign for those six fastballs so we had to get we had to find a way to give a cutter in or a cutter away without just giving a one because because if his ball even though he didn't throw that hard if his ball moved a foot one way or another that's two feet and if there's a guy on third i want to know which way the ball's going right. right so that's why we came up with that system i don't there wasn't anybody else that i was aware of that i could have used that with but it but it but in terms of you know what we did as pitchers and catchers a lot of that carried over from one guy to the next because you know it was i think it was effective you know i think the more more time we spent talking about hitters whether it was in meetings or on the field the more beneficial it was when we came time to call in the game you know in terms of getting along and you know making the right call but um i mean i i, I don't recall doing anything like that with with any other guy Although I only played one more year after our year together in in two thousand and one, and and most of the guys were just they were just four pitch guys. Not that that's that's a bad thing, but there were four pitch guys to both sides of the plate, so it was fairly straightforward. What per what percentage? Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, no, the other thing about that would have been you know if he knows the location, he can catch the ball, frame the ball a little bit. You know, framing. In today's game, I think it's a lot. You know, they're they're a lot, doing a lot of this, right? Where yeah. you were a little more. Let's set up. Let's throw to that target, and mm -hmm. you know, let me give the umpire a good look mm -hmm. at what. So if he doesn't know where that location is, and he's guessing, and he guesses wrong, and he catches a ball awkwardly, let alone him with a man on third, you know, so there's a benefit there as well. Mm -hmm. For you guys, what percentage of the game was you calling what pitch you wanted to versus tr you know trusting the catcher to call the game? Um, me personally, after being burned and going home and never being able to sleep after throwing a pitch that I didn't want to throw, I made a commitment to myself that I would never do it again. And so before I stepped foot on that rubber, I knew what sign I was gonna, I was looking for, and I would shake until I got it. Mm -hmm. There were moments where I wasn't sure. And before I stepped foot on the rubber, I had to say, whatever he throws down right here, that's what I'm throwing. But I had to play the commitment game where I have to be fully committed on this pitch because a committed pitch, even if it was the wrong pitch, is the right pitch in that moment for yeah. me because I can execute that pitch if I'm committed to it. Yeah, I I can't say that I called my own games completely. Uh, there were times I think I'd go through phases. But I, I really relied on my catcher. We'd sit down and have pregame meetings. I had pitching charts that I would keep, or you know, I'd get copies of the pitching charts and make notes on them. I had a little notebook that I'd put notes in it. I'd bring that to our little powwow. And you know, the other thing too for me, you know, it's a little different as a start from a, as a starting pitcher versus a relief pitcher who yeah. might be in for a hitter. You know, back in yeah. the in our day, now it's you got to be in for three, but. Um, if I'm pitching in the latter part of a series, I'm watching that series, but he might be catching two or one or two of those games beforehand. So he's, he's right there behind the plate. So his input to that meeting becomes really important for me because I'm, I'm looking to face these guys two to three times through an order. So, all right. So now how, what are you starting them off with? What are they getting hits on? What are you getting them out with? What situations are we in? So there's a lot of variables that come into play and you, we, we can sit and have meetings and say, all right, this is what we want to do. But once you get out across the line and you start to compete, you don't know in that meeting, you don't know what kind of stuff you're going to have that day. That's right. right. And you don't know what kind of, you know, what type of, you know, strike zone there's going to be, how aggressive the opposing team's going to be. You know, a lot of guys, you know, you, you know, the RBI guys, you can count on with a man in scoring position that they, potentially are really aggressive early in the count, right? That's putting, you know, food on their table, you know, they're, and they're good at it and they're good at it for a reason. So you have to be aware of the, you know, who, who does what in certain situations. Yeah. They can always, you know, come off of that, you know, Julio Franco, you know, back in the day, rarely swung at a first pitch, right? But every now and then he'd swing at a first pitch and he'd, and he'd hit it. Well, I'm trying to think of the shortstop right now with the, the Rangers Seager, 
he doesn't swing at many first pitches, but you know, he, but he's a threat, right? So you can't just say, oh, okay, I'm going to lay this ball in there because he, I'm going to take the, my chances that he's not going to swing. He's got a bat in his hand. He can do damage. So to me, it's, it's a matter of, you know what, you got to trust your stuff. That relationship that you have with your catcher is really, really important. And I feel like the more I spent with time with the catcher behind the plate, I could read body language. He could read my body language. And there were many a times where, you know, timeout, he'd be come out to the mound, say, what do you want to do here? And I'd say, I don't know. What do you think we should do? And I'm not sure. And my response was, you know what? Why don't you turn around, go back to home plate. You think about it. <laughs> and what you put down, I may throw and I may not throw. And I'll think about it as well. And there were times, too. We'd wait till the umpire came out. We'd ask the umpire what to throw. <laughs> and it'd be interesting some of the responses you get, right? Sometimes they'd say, throw a strike, throw a changeup, you know. So, and if we end up throwing the pitch that they threw out, you know, said, and we had good results, they got to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, I know for me, the the pitcher, the, the pitcher's the one that really, it's his responsibility, right? He's the one that's going to answer to the manager if a guy hits it out of the park. He's a guy that's... He's on the hook for everything. So ultimately, it's their decision on what they want to throw. Um, I have, you know, based on the, the the video that I've watched, the stats that the guys had, all the research that I've done, I have a pretty good idea of how we want to attack each guy. Most of these guys, they, they do what they did to get them there, and they don't venture off that. That doesn't mean that a guy's not going to swing at a first pitch occasionally, but I mean, the reason that that guy's successful is because he constantly takes the first pitches. He he likes to do that, and so most guys will keep that 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 what they did to get him there type thing. So we would try to devise a game plan, and then I would offer a suggestion to the pitcher. Then the pitcher would either say yes, I like it, or no, I don't, and then he would throw what he wants to throw. I didn't usually get into a, an argument with a pitcher about what to throw, like because it's there, it's there on the hook for it. But there were times that I had a really strong feeling about it, and I would run out there and say, I think that's a bad idea. I think if you throw this guy a cutter in, you've got him. One pitch, he'll hit a ground ball third. We got a double play. We are out of here. I know he's he's sitting on it. And that happened so many times. I think for me, if I could convince the pitcher that this is the right pitch and he, he convinced himself of it, he'd execute it. Yeah. And, I mean, how many times would Adrian Beltre hit a ground ball to third and roll into a double play? He did it all the time. And there are certain right-handers that just – they just did that, you know. And and if you could execute a pitch like that in a situation where they were sitting on getting the bad head out, we could get him to hit into a double play. Um, but but most of the time, it was – they had the ball in their hand. It's their, it's their deal, and I would just offer suggestions based on what we talked about before and what we what we know about a hitter. It's funny because uh, yesterday it just came out that Cal Raleigh, the current catcher for the Mariners, when a pitcher will shake him, sometimes he'll just stare at the pitcher until they throw the pitch that he called because he's like, no, this is the pitch that we're throwing. So it's interesting hearing the, the difference we, between. I, I remember I remember having this doing this with you and a few other guys that had a lot of pitches, and I would give the shake-off sign – the shake-off sign, the shake-off sign. And I'd give it four or five times, and I'm like, time out. I don't know what the, this guy's <laughs> thinking about. And I'd run out to the mound and say, all right, I'm just doing that. I got to go back now because the hitter doesn't know now what's going on. He thinks that, you know, that the pitcher might try to begin to a certain pitch. But there's there's all different types of games that guys play when when hitters are up there. I know I used to do that sometimes with pitchers, but – like how many pitches does a does a yeah guy well yeah but everybody knew that that Jamie had a lot of pitches or variations of pitches so it was easy to do with him I got to find out what this guy wants to throw here and then the pit the hitter sometimes thinks well maybe it's not as obvious as I'm thinking it is right because a lot of times the hitters are especially nowadays with that that helmet they're sitting on so many breaking balls you, you notice how many breaking balls are getting hit out of the park right now I mean breaking well, balls that aren't that bad but that's right. all they throw now. It's There's like a lot of people throwing ball them all day long, but like they're first but, inning. That and, never and happened with you guys. No. And they're sitting on them. I mean, you can tell. You can tell a guy's sitting on a breaking ball by his swing, right? You can tell he's sitting on a breaking ball if he doesn't chase one that looks like a fastball that's outside and breaks off the plate. He's he's sitting on it. They got to be. So if we can try to somehow put a doubt in his mind that well maybe maybe that's not a breaking ball, you know, then I don't know. Maybe it might give us an advantage that pitch in that situation. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I, th- I think for me, the Cal Raleigh situation, I, I came up with a guy. I won't mention his name. We'll keep the conversation private. But <laughs> um, so he came up together through the minor leagues, drafted the same year. And, you know, he'd always give me grief if I gave up a hit when I shook him off. And it happened all the time. And I eventually, like, got in his face one day. I was like, the day you start paying my bills, you can call every pitch. And I'll throw it. I go, until then, I'm going to be paying my own bills, and I know you're not going to pay my bills. You sit back there, and you just set up, and you catch it, and I'll try to hit my spot. And then he just looked at me. He was like, all right, we'll run it like that. <laughs> but we never had a situation again just because that's how I had to be when I pitched. I had to be fully convinced that that was the right pitch. And that was a good buddy of mine, so I could have that conversation. But when I was coming up, you know, whatever they threw down, I was like, yeah, I'm throwing that. I'm throwing that. I'm throwing that. Whatever you whatever you call down, because I don't, I didn't know all the hitters. You know, and you have all these meetings, you're in your first, you know, hitters meeting, you know, going through all the hitters in the major leagues, and everybody looks like the bat, the barrel's like this big. You're like, all right, well, here we go. I just got to execute. So whatever they threw down, I was like, I just got to execute the pitch. That's a good point, though. It can be overwhelming for, for a young pitcher, you know, to sit in a meeting and, Oh, this guy's a good fastball hitter, and oh, and by the way, he'll hit the breaking ball, and you know, and you're going, oh, really? Oh, well, then what do I throw him? Right. So you have to, you know, you, you, when you're cutting your teeth yeah. in this game, you know, which I know, even back in the era that I broke in, I'd sit in meetings and I'd be like, I can't throw my fastball today, mm-hmm. and yeah. and I'd be like, this, not, what do I do? And then who do you talk to about it? You really couldn't talk to anybody about it because you kind of felt like a wimp, That's right. you know, and then you just kind of had to experience, okay, it's the when and the how. And then, you know, you start to really realize how important location is because when you can start to locate, I believe you can throw any pitch in any situation if you locate it. Yep. If it's a well-located pitch, yeah, they're going to get hits, but you know, in certain situations, you know, like, you know, there's a rule that I learned early in my career, you never get beat in late. Yeah. You know, that was a Nolan Ryan rule. You never get beat in late. Okay. I watch games today and guys are getting beat in all the time. You never give up an O2 hit. You know, that's hap- that happens probably once, twice a game in today's game. You know, so the, you know, again, and again, yeah. the game is different, right? And it's played differently. It's thought differently. And, and, you know, the information is, I can't even fathom the information that comes in today. It's, it, it's almost too much because I believe that, you know, this relationship that you have with your catcher and you have a hitter in front of you, we're both trying to read the hitter. And then there are times when you have an experienced hitter that will try to set you up. He'll purposely take a early in the count, purposely take a, ba- a bad swing on a pitch, but then he'll sit on that pitch expecting to get it sometime later in the at bat or maybe in another at bat. So, you know, again, that's where the catcher comes into play. Like, okay, this guy's playing with us. You know, we're not going to give him that pitch or eh, we'll give it to him, but we're not going to give it to him where he's, where he thinks he's going to get it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of gamesmanship that, that I think goes on in that 60 feet, six inch space. I mean, we would have, I remember meetings when I was at the Rangers, Mike Maddox was our pitching coach. He was phenomenal, like, game plan. I played with him. God, he was so good. Yeah, like, he would good. spend hours before every series, and you would have every piece of information you could have, video for every hitter, here's his outs, here's his hot zones, cold zones. But sometimes it was so much information, and, like, you're looking at this hot and cold zone, and there's, like, a red box, and he's one for one. And it's like, you can't go there. And I'm... Click on that. So you click on it. Here comes the video with attached to that. And the guy just gets fisted and he dribbles it down the third baseline for a base hit. And he goes, so you're telling me that we can't go in there with a fastball. <laughs> and so sometimes you got, you have to do more research on yeah. this stuff. Right. Um, or even like he can't, he can't <clears throat> hit a curveball, but he can hit a slider. Well, I don't throw a curveball. So does that mean I can't go in there and throw my slider today? Because he hasn't seen my slider. Mm-hmm. Maybe my slider is different than the ones he's hitting. Mm-hmm. And so we would always walk out of those meetings and I would tell the young guys, like, this is great information, but do what you're good at. Like, you can't go away from your strength. Don't forget who you are. That's mm-hmm. it. Or you what cannot. got you to the big league. That's right. Yeah. You can't go away from it. If it got you here and you're having success with it because your stuff might be different than what you're seeing on that video. Yeah. Um, so now I was a big component on that. Just 
making sure the young guys knew your stuff is good enough and you're here for well, a reason. And then the other thing with the pitchers too, some guys hide the ball better than other yeah, guys. Exactly right. I mean, there's so many, the, the background, the hitting background, if there's shadows or if there's a shadow between the mound and home plate, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many other variables. There's umpires yep. involved, right? Yep. I mean, there's a lot of variables that are involved. So you can't just, to me, you just can't be single-minded and stay one way. I mean, yep. you can until they force you to change, but then you got to play that chess game. That's right. Did you guys watch Sunday Night Baseball last night? No. Okay, mm -hmm. a couple things, and I have a point to this, but... Uh, I didn't know that was our homework. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it was the Mariners and the Mets, and it was the first time that the Mariners had hosted the Sunday Night Baseball in 20 years. Wow. The last time that they hosted it, you were the starting pitcher. Wow. And on yeah. top of that, if you watch the game, the shadows during that game because it was like a 410 start absolutely oh, yeah. insane the yeah. shadow was right between the pitcher's yep. mound and the home plate for a good part of the game so you got guys th throwing 100 miles an hour and then you have to deal with the shadow and then also the reflection of the uh you know hitter's eye or the batter's eye behind them so there's all those variables that are working into it now uh regarding tunneling and um kind of working off the last pitch that you threw i think the last time that we talked you said that you didn't learn about tunneling until you were like 10 years and I didn't know what that, what that word meant. I tunneling is when you drive down the highway and you go through a tunnel in the mountain. That's <laughs> tunneling for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never heard that term. Okay. So working off of, we were just talking about, you know, catchers calling the game versus pitchers calling the game. How much of it is throwing your next pitch off of the pitch that came in right before it and kind of trying to make it look the same until mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't yeah. have to, I throw them, but yeah, I can say that I, I did that, but I didn't. We didn't use the word tunneling. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just tried to make the pitch look the same until it got that last couple feet where it was going to move off of it. But we didn't have the you know the fancy words, you know that you know just like what's the one that they got a new curveball that the sweeper. The sweeper. You know, yeah. Well, what's the difference between a sweeper and a curveball, right? And then there's some sort of new changeup. I think that came out too. There's, a, there's this, the, the split change. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine if you had that it, one too yeah. in the back. The, yeah. the wet change. It, it, I mean, <laughs> again, this is part of the game and I think it's wonderful. I'm not condoning it, but it's, you know, you're talking to some dinosaurs here, you know, and you're even part of that, yeah. you know, that dinosaur era. So, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. The and, best era you know, ever. And, and people have come up with terminology and things like that. That's great. You know, I, I think it's wonderful, but yeah, we're, you know, to have pitches that can work, go to two different ways or that, that have some little more depth to them. And then of course, today with all the, 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 uh, velocity, you get a lot of elevation, you know, and the ball stays truer, almost looking like it's rising. I mean, I think that we used our fastballs a lot more when we definitely, played, and I think that that made your secondary better. You didn't have to be so perfect. You know, for me, I was a hard thrower. So. I knew that my breaking ball just had to be on the plate mm -hmm. and just down. And well, I was going to get a swing. I think for me, the separator from the eras that we played in to today's, you know, say the last 10, 5, 10 years is pitching inside. Yes. You, you, yes. you Nobody pitches inside no. to move feet, right? Speed it's, up it's, hands. It's to yeah. speed up hands. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not to hurt anybody. Or for effect. It's for mm -hmm. to, to come in. Yeah. And occasionally you're going to hit somebody. Okay, but you know what? They have the ability to get out of the way too. But I think from what I when I watch in today's game, hitters have gotten so comfortable that they don't have to think about in. Right, and I've seen some guys with unbelievably quick hands on balls in. I'm like, how are they getting to those balls? But everything is away, away. It's kind of like the college game. It's away, 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 away. And when you throw in or throw in for effect, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. And I think that that's made pitching even harder because people don't pitch in for effect anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, go ask, you know, guys like Pedro Martinez and Bob Gibson and, you know, they live Nolan Ryan who lived in, they, you know, they were trying to intimidate in. Right. And that opens up, you know, that outer part of the plate. Absolutely. You don't have to be perfect. You can just be outer third. Right. Because you've, push that plate out a little bit farther because now they're mindful of the inside part of the plate. Or, I mean, I, I did this a lot, even coming up because this is, I feel like it got me into the big leagues and the minor leagues. I would get O two 2 
and I would aim at their hands. I go, you mm. want to take this off the hands, go for it. But if I hit that spot, you're being knocked down on the ground. And every I could throw whatever I want after that. It doesn't even have to be good. Mm. And I did that. I was showing my son a video the other day of um, my second game. We were in Toronto, and Eric Hinsky's in the box. And I go, first pitch, fastball, take, change up, foul ball, and I blow his doors off up here and knock him down. And my son's like, did you do that on purpose? I go, yeah, I did. Watch the next pitch. And it was just a change up down and away. And he's way out front, and throws his bat, throws his helmet. Mm-hmm. And he goes, can I start doing that? I go, dude, you can't even throw strikes three times <laughs> <Yeah>. first. <laughs> we start pumping strikes with our fastball. You can do whatever yeah. you want with it. But you could go in and just put your fastball where you want to and just turn them into a seesaw, and you can get the job done. Well, and I think there's a mentality. You, you, you know, like, how old's your son? Eight. Yeah, so he doesn't understand that yet, right? right? But there's a mentality. You don't just say, okay, I'm going to start pitching in. You have to work on that. That's right. Right. It you know, and in, in little league, teenage years, probably not doing that. High school, maybe if you're advanced enough. College, they probably don't do it no. very much. And there they teach the hitters to roll into the ball right. to take, you know, to take it. Um I wasn't but, comfortable until I was in the big in the pros. Right. And it took a long time. And then learning how to, I didn't learn how to pitch inside till I got to double A. Yeah. And you know, you start getting your head beat in. Right. enough where you're going okay i gotta make some changes here and then i had my pitching coach dick pole was like look you're gonna have to learn how to pitch inside yeah. even with your measly 83 right it still can have an effect and yeah you're gonna hit some people and you might upset some people but you're not gonna hurt anybody right and my intent was never to hurt anybody but i hit a lot of people over the course of my career so but i i didn't care because I, I didn't let that affect me and also understood that that's my part of the plate, and so is this, and you get the middle. And if I'm throwing it in the middle and you're, you know, tally whacking the ball, then that's on me. I right. got to figure out a way to change that, right? Mm-hmm. But that's where the cat and mouse game for me, east and west, I wasn't really a north guy because I didn't have the velocity, but I could go south and I could go a little bit below south. And, but, Figuring out how to do that, get guys, you know, speed them up, slow them down, elevate maybe a ball up and in where it's closer to their eyes. And as Mark just said, you you upset somebody or piss somebody off. That's your whole goal because now it gets them out of their mindset of being becoming right. a nice, relaxed hitter to now becoming aggressive. And you drop a change up on them and you, you know, you screw them into the ground and that's right. You get the results you're looking for. Exactly right. And now you want only not only the physical game, but the mental game. But not only just for that at bat, but future at bat. That's yep, exactly. You know, because exactly. they never forget that. They and they'll know that you'll that. come in. That's right. They're, they they always have that doubt in their mind that mm, this guy yeah. might be just crazy enough to come back in again. Mm-hmm. Or double on you know, you don't see many guys doubling up in or tripling up in anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, it's in once and away. Yeah, and there's an advantage, too, to be able to throw inside for strikes. You know, you don't want to just throw inside and knock guys back, or they'll just, you know, maybe not if they're throwing extremely hard, but most guys, if they, if I know if a guy's just brushing me back or if he's trying to throw strikes in there, if he's trying to throw strikes in there, now I have to, especially with two strikes, I have to be aware that I, I need to expand my strikes on a little bit. He's not just brushing me off to go away, whereas if, he, if a guy throws strikes in there, now all of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay, I, I need to be aware that he's not just trying to get me off the plate, I, and then I'm going to go back out there. You know what I mean? So I think there's an advantage to to, to throw an inside, to, to knock guys off the plate, to show them that you will throw in there, and to be able to throw strikes in there. I know with Jamie, we had, when he would throw to left, uh, to, to right-handers, he would throw a four-seamer in, okay, that would start at him, that would come back over the plate. Maddox did it. Maddox did it to left-handers all the time Mm -hmm. where you you thought it was going to hit us, you know, and then it would come back over the plate. And as a hitter, your first reaction is to get out of the way. And if all you're doing is trying to move their feet in that situation, then it's a ball and, oh, two, it serves its purpose. But one, one, it doesn't. Or first pitch, it doesn't, right? It puts the hitter to an an advantage. But if you throw it at him and he moves out of the way and it runs back over the plate, now all of a sudden I, I can't even lean out over the plate and expect to get it. I mean, anything inside might might be a strike too. So 
I, I think pitching inside is to is is way it, it it just doesn't happen near as much as it used to because it it can do so much to make a hitter change the way he he approaches his at bat, and it makes a guy that doesn't throw as hard more effective, and a guy that throws hard he's going to be able to get away with more pitches because the hitter thinks he's got to be quicker to get to the to get the bat to the ball, which means his front side goes, his hands go, everything goes, and that now now the down, down and away, away, anything off speed is you can you can afford to miss more if you can make a speed of a batter's hands up. I also think that that pitcher's not hitting anymore mm -hmm. will have an effect on knowing how to pitch because the way I pitched because I understood hitting, I was an outfielder going into college, is if I always had a guy that was going the other way, in order to hit the ball the other way, you have to let it travel. So the inside, you can't let that ball travel. Your mm -hmm. hands are broken. Same thing, you got a guy that's a pool hitter. He's got to catch it out front. We'll try to catch the outside pitch out front, and I've got a ground ball to second base if you're left-handed all day long. And that's how I pitch because I understood the swing path and how it works. Did you get beat? Yeah, when you miss middle. But hitting is timing. Pitching is upsetting that timing. And if you understand both sides of the plate and how the, the bat path works and timing and how hard it is to actually make that work as a hitter, I mean, pitcher's in the driver's seat. Yeah. I mean, really, I would hate to be a hitter, especially with the stuff that these guys have yeah. now. If they knew how to use it yeah, the correct way, I mean, it's, it's well, insane. Yeah. And I think, you know, like if you're trying to pitch inside and you can't throw strikes, well, guess what? The smarter hitters are going to go, I don't have to look inside. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, all I have to do is get out of the way because yeah. he hasn't established any part of the strike zone inside. Yeah. Or, you know, and that's what the really good hitters do. They just start to delete pitches or they delete a side of the plate. Yeah, exactly right. right? Yeah. And when they can start doing that, John Olerud kind of walked me through that back when I played in Seattle. He's like, look, if I got a pitcher that can throw all of his pitches to both sides of the plate, I may be in for a tough day. But if I can delete one or two pitches to either side of the plate, now I can start guessing to – what what I can hit and what I want to hit based on the situation. And a big shout out to Dev's Coffee Bar. They are the sponsor of this podcast. This is their podcast studio. If you are located anywhere around Southwest Washington, make sure to check out one of their three locations. And if you're a big coffee guy like I am, make sure to check out orderdevs.com. Use code COUCHGM for free shipping off your order. And like the Mariners today, they say like hunt the green box. And what that means is like a pitcher will give up the most damage in a certain location with a certain pitch. So the Mariners, I guess this is just from what I've heard is that they're hunting that pitch that the pitcher typically gives up the most damage on. So they're looking for that pitcher's weakness in the zone and the pitch type. So where his try misses to are. Yeah. Or where, yeah, he typically is giving up the most okay. slug in this certain area with this pitch. So like hunt that pitch in that area. I don't even know. I mean, hitting is so hard. Yeah. Like I don't understand how you could go up there yeah. and even right. do that. Well, look, strikeouts are no longer an issue. That's true. Right? It's okay to strike out. That's for sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, again, I, I I hate to come sit here and do this interview and compare because I, I think it's unfair, right? But I will say 20, 30 years ago, if you struck out 100, 125 times, you were not in the big leagues. Nope. <laughs> you were in AAA, you were in AA, you were right. somewhere else other than the big leagues figuring out how you're going to make contact or drive the ball to the ballpark in it's a different style of game today. So strikeouts are okay because we can hit home runs. Ballparks are smaller. Baseballs may be harder. You hear people talking about, you know, the hardness of a baseball. I don't know. And I don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean a hill of beans to me anymore. But th these are all things that go in, 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 into what's happening. The Mariners have something like a 213 batting average this year, which is on a historically low it would be the lowest in their franchise. And they also are on a historic pace for strikeouts. So just across the game, it's like you're hunting the power and the damage, and that's all you're looking for. Which uh, When does this get old? At, I know. At, at what point for baseball does this get old? I, I don't know. You know, like, okay. Because, you, 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 you know, when, when, you, when you're having these people having these arguments, you're like, okay, well, sooner or later it's going to go back, you know, or we'll find something in the middle. You know, I think that would be a wonderful thing, but you know, and, but you know, who comes up with the idea? Who trusts the idea? You know, I mean, it's it's a salesmanship, I think. 
it's a kind of off question, uh, changing subjects. When a coach would come out to the pitcher's mound to try to settle you down, how much of it was them actually talking game strategy versus did you have any coaches come up and tell a funny story to just try to relax you up there? Early in my career, Frank Lucchese was an interim manager when I was with the Cubs, and I was nibble, 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 right? And he came out and reached into his back pocket, and he pulled out a, a Wrigley Spearmint gum wrapper. It was silver on one side and white on the other side, and he unfolded it. He said, you see this piece of paper? I said, yeah. He goes, it's a fine piece of paper. You're pitching too fine. And he turned around and walked off. And I was just like, you know, I was probably my first or second year player, you know, and struggling mightily. I can remember, it was in Philadelphia, right? I was struggling mightily. And I'm like, okay, how do I, you know, how, do, where does this fit in, right, right? At the time. But after I thought about it for a while, I was like, oh, that made sense. But yeah, but it, it to me, a pitching coach is coming out to break up the monotony, mm -hmm. right? You're struggling or the game's speeding up, um, you know, and I think there's an art to that as a pitching coach. You know, you, you brought up Mike Maddox before. I know there's one. When he goes out, he always touches oh, his his pitcher on the shoulder, puts mm -hmm. his hand on his shoulder, and I forget what the ration reasoning is for that. It, it's a palming. Mm -hmm. It's a it's calming. Palming thing. Yeah, yeah, just the fact that somebody's so touching. Everybody them. has their yeah. own way of doing things, right? And you know, I think Mike Maddox. You know, I played with Mike as well. Um, you know, spot starter relief pitcher was a very good pitcher. But I think he's become even a, a better pitching coach. I think he's got a real good feel for the game, a real good understanding of the game, but he understands people. And I think that's as a pitching coach, you know, you get, just like a catcher, you got to understand what what makes each guy go, what motivates him, when to, you know, kick him in the butt, when to pat him on the back, you know, and, and, and that because baseball – Again, even for pitchers, you know, you heard with hitters, it's a game of failure. It can be a game of failure for 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 a starting pitcher or a relief pitcher, yeah. right? Yeah. You you give it up the night before, and you know you're the first one called the That's next right. day, and you're you're a little unsure or insecure. Ah, right. Can I do that? You know, they might be looking for the you know. Again, it comes back to what execution. That's right. Yeah, you know, let me execute. Yeah, I mean, at the highest level, I mean, and you don't really realize. I didn't realize this until after I was done playing it the small percentage of people who actually did what we did. And that should like, you should wake up in the morning with confidence going into the right. field, going, what an opportunity, you know, it's not until you sit down when the, it's not chaotic around you. And, mm -hmm. You know, I need to do this to provide for my family and everything's so stressful. Um, but for me, it was just awesome just to go in and have that opportunity each and every day, you know, just to go in and do your thing and, that was it. And just leave it there. Well, and I think sometimes when we struggle too, if you struggle, you know, consecutive times and you're thinking, okay, am I tipping pitches? Now all of a sudden, you know, the construction tape comes out and you're sitting in the video room and you're watching all okay. you know, you're talking to your hitters, you're talking to the catchers, watch this, watch that. You didn't go out in the bullpen, you know, but you can't emulate what you're doing in a game, right? right? But sometimes we do tip pitches, right? And it, it's sometimes it's the simplest of things. Um, I know I went through a spell during my career where the Yankees just uh, every change up I threw, they were all over and I couldn't figure it out. And it was basically, you know, with my fastball, my elbow was in with my change up, my elbow was out. Yeah. It took me three months to figure that out. I looked at video, could not figure it out, you know, and we all do it. Yep. I mean, the Yankees were notorious for that. Yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that pitching coaches typically or a manager when they come out there, they're they're telling them that. I think, no. you know, for your it's more just to you know, hey, just settle down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, we're, let's go at this guy. Let's get him to hit a ground ball. Give him something positive to mm -hmm. think about. Breaking up the momentum. It's it's kind of like when when pitchers throw. You know, we talk about rhythm. That that's one of my my four keys to pitching. Even though I wasn't a pitcher, is try to keep the pitcher in a rhythm. You know, get them working so that they're not thinking too much out there, thinking about mechanics, but getting in a rhythm. And so, so by be by being able to be on the same page, we help pitchers stay in a rhythm. But if a pitcher goes two and zero, oh, we want to get them out of that rhythm, right? We don't want them to get back on the mound and throw another ball. So that would be an example of when how me as a signal caller might wait a little more, or he would walk around the mound maybe once or twice before he gets back on the mound. Well, that starts happening after two or three hitters. 
pitching coach might want to get out there or the manager and say, Hey, okay, we need to, we need to slow this down. Let's, let's, let's change what we're doing here. Let's try this. We'll get this guy here. We got this guy on deck and give them maybe change their mindset, you know, something like that. Whereas a guy like Lou, when he would come out there, <laughs> he wouldn't say anything about anything like that. He might, he might get on you for not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Try to encourage you with some, some, some offbeat humor and then get out of there, you know? So I think, I think everybody had kind of their own way of doing stuff. Lou went out there if he was sick and tired of what he was seeing. And you knew if he went out there that, that there was a problem, you know, otherwise he would send steamer out or he would send, you know, BP out. And it was a little bit more of a civil conversation or a, a civil discussion. But, um, I don't think they're really, I, you guys know more than me, but they never really talk much about mechanics you know, out there, they might say, ah, you're getting under the ball a little bit, but more is just to break up rhythm. Yeah. Your catcher usually saw that before anybody else Yeah, you had some kind of motion. Hey, stay all the way down the mound. You're pulling off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, something simple. Yeah. I would, I could use, I, I didn't like to tell my pitchers what they were doing wrong because I, I, I wasn't a pitcher, but I could tell them what his ball was doing. Hey, you know, your ball's doing this instead of this. Yeah, okay, I'm getting on the side of it a little bit. They would know how to do that. I could just tell them what I'm seeing. Hey, yeah. it's it's flat. You know, your your slider's flat or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think most guys stayed. With. Pitching coaches could talk about mechanics better than catchers would. But I think it was more just to break up what was going on and try to change their focus. And it's really, I mean, so much of pitching is 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 upstairs. You know, like Mark said, being committed to making the pitch knowing that if you make that pitch you're going to go to get a good result and most of the time you do you know most of the time if we locate we're going to get the result that we want or we're not going to get hurt you know i mean a guy might hit a you know get a ball at the end of the bat or hit a ball in the hole but you don't get hurt most of the time when you locate what was your favorite stadium that you played in and why oh man you know i got i got my first win at the old yankee stadium and I like for me, I just love baseball as a kid growing up. I love watching, you know, the Cubs would come on TV all the time with I think it was WGN. You would get that all the time. I was an Astros fan growing up in Houston. Um, but I just love the historical ballparks. So the Wrigley Fields, the the Fenway Park, the old Yankee Stadium. I mean, they were it was just special. Um, the new one's phenomenal. Like it's almost like a the four seasons. <laughs> the place is ridiculous. Um, but I, I, I love the history and I love the sound and the feels of things that I watched growing up as a kid. And you watch it on TV and all the World Series they went to. And then you go in and you're on the stage. I think my first game there, I came in with bases loaded. Uh, Washburn had just came out and I had Jorge Posada and A Rod and got out of it and got a win. We scored the next inning. They yanked me out and that was it. So. That always stuck with me. Um, Seattle was always phenomenal. Um, spent five years of my career there. You know, it's just perfect. Clubhouse was comfortable and good food, and um, the bullpen was nice. Great view. Yeah, I kind of echo what Mark said. You know, the historical parts of the ballparks, you know, having the opportunity to play in old Yankee Stadium and, and realize, you know, having the wonderful opportunity to play in a place like that where so much hist the history of baseball has been created. Uh, Same, I broke in in Wrigley Field. I had never been there until I got called up. Um, you know, Fenway Park, another historical ballpark, Old Comiskey. I played in Old Comiskey Park, so I'm aging myself. I played in some of the older ballparks as well. Um, but, yeah, those those types of ballparks are were wonderful. Safeco at the time was, you know, I like the kingdom. I had success in the kingdom, so I I was kind of sad to see it go. But it was also nice to be able to be outdoors. And Safeco was a was a wonderful ballpark. Um, I mean, the in in a way, they're all wonderful. You know, some mm -hmm. better than others. You know, Miami, it's tough. It's it's hot. Texas is hot. Oh man. You know, you know. Now they have oh, a roof. I know. But when they didn't, it was oh, miserable. Boy. Right, Awful. Houston, you're 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 happy that they had. You know, I played in the Astrodome. You know, that was a you know another interesting place to play in. You know, and a huge ballpark. So, um, yeah, it just it, to me, it's just having the opportunity. I think I played in like fifty or fifty-one different ballparks, which is 
for me, it was kind of cool just to be able to look back and go, yeah, I, yeah, I did play there, you know. You know, you you look at uh, was it old Comiskey Park where they had the the disco night? You know, it was back when I was a kid, but they had the disco night and they were throwing all the records on the field. You know, it's like, hmm, yeah, I just saw a thing on uh, Instagram the other day where Jack Brickhouse it was the when they uh, the first light or when they turned when they got lights at Wrigley, and it had like a ninety one year old gentleman that they had picked out. You know, to press the button, you know, awesome. and I sent that to my kids. I'm like, you know what, your dad was there that day. I mean, I, I hadn't even thought about that. And it was 8 8 88. And then we got rained out. We played the next day. And uh, Rick Sutcliffe started that game. And I mean, that's a historical day for baseball. You know, we played in a Wrigley Field, never had lights, right? Now they have, you know, and today you go ask some 15, 18, 25 year old person, they go, oh, yeah, they've had lights forever. They didn't. Yeah. We played all day games, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I, re I remember watching, you know, when we were kids, you know, WGN, WTBS, so all the games in Atlanta and and Wrigley were were on TV, and so that's what that's what you watched, and um, it was it was neat playing in those ballparks, actually walking into them for the first time and seeing how much different they look, you know, when you walk onto the field as opposed to looking at them from the yeah. from the stands. I got my first two hits in, at Wrigley Field, so. Uh, there's there's always a place in my heart for Wrigley. Um, I I gotta agree with them. Yankee Stadium was is is probably my favorite place to play as a visitor, just because it, it. I mean, it's always full. There's always. I mean, you're playing the Yankees. You know, I played in old Yankee Stadium. It was. I mean, all the great players played there. So much history was made there. Um, but I also like playing in the at the places that I played well in too. So like a lot of guys didn't like going to Minnesota, but I I loved it. <laughs> You know, I loved hitting there. I loved hitting in, at Coors Field. I loved, um, I loved hitting in um, in Arlington. It was hot, but I loved it. You know, I I love going to play the Rangers. I mean, I it was I just I loved hitting there. So there were there were you know there were parks I loved as a home player. I loved St. Louis. I mean, what a great place to play. If you've, I mean, spent any time in St. Louis, you gotta love playing there. Even if you're a visiting player, they 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 just treat you so well. Um, and of course, Seattle was. You know, it was well, it was home for me. I grew up in Bellevue and went to high school in Seattle. So, I worked for the Mariners when I was fourteen, fifteen years old in the clubhouse. So, you know, being able to come back there and play was was special, especially in the Kingdom, and then again um, at, at Safeco. Um, but I, you know, for me, I, when I got there, I was so happy to be in the big leagues. I, I I was honestly happy playing in old Cleveland Municipal Stadium for the short time I was up and. I played an old exhibition in Toronto and and then old Tiger Stadium um, in Detroit. So um, yeah, playing in the playing in the places that you saw when you were a kid, I, I think I think at least for for me it was special. I think that's a really cool thing about baseball is they're all cathedrals. You know, they're all different different dimensions, different feels. Whereas other sports, it's all the same everywhere you go. Um, when you did, you have the same success in T-Mobile Park or Safeco as you did in the Kingdom, and same with yourself? Well, I, I, we were pretty good in both of those places. So, I mean, in my first couple of years in Seattle, we were in, in the Kingdom. We felt, well, we were in the playoffs against the Orioles uh, one year, but we didn't we didn't make it very far. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a bigger ballpark, Safeco Field. And I don't think the ball was carrying as well when when the when the ballpark was first opened, you know. And they would talk about well, the cement was dry, but it wasn't completely dry. And you know, I mean, there were you know, you're outdoors, and I mean, there were all kinds of reasons and rationale. I didn't buy into any of it, but I knew that the ballpark was bigger. The ball didn't carry as well um, when the roof was. I didn't think when the roof was open. I didn't think the ball carried as well. Versus when the roof was closed, there's a little more heat, a little more humidity in the ballpark. Um, I thought, you know, and I think, you know, the way I had a few teammates or we had a few teammates that would gripe when the roof was open mm -hmm. versus when it was closed. Um, but again, you know, now what most organizations, you know, Baltimore has done it. A lot of organizations have moved their fences in or, you know, they've done it in Chicago. It's not Comiskey Park. I don't know. It's, it used to be Cellular One Field. I don't know what it's called now. They've done it. 
a lot of ballparks, you know, they'll move them in, they'll move them out, they'll, they'll, they'll elevate them, you know. So, you know, I think they try to build it towards the personnel that they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just play the game. You know, it's your home field, but you should have a home field advantage, I think. Yeah. Well, I've always felt that the Mariners should build a team on guys getting on base, mm-hmm. putting the ball on the ground, beat it out, the old Mike Sosha style of baseball with the Sean Figgins and – Howie Kendrick, yep. those guys were awful to play against. Garrett Anderson and just get those guys on base, get hitting and running and stealing and moving as a pitcher. When you're, when you're doing that, you a little bit take your mind off of what's going on at the plate and you start thinking about all the things that are around you. There's and a lot those, more distractions. Those right? innings, they pile up fast. Base hits. Base hits. At well, and it's pressure on the defense too. 100%. Mm-hmm. And if you're not ahead in the count, that puts more pressure on you. Right. I mean, there's a lot of variables that come into that style of play that yeah. you're talking about that put pressure on the pitcher and the defense and the catcher. Yep. And, and the opposing manager. That's right. Right? Mm-hmm. And I've yeah. always felt that if Seattle could build yeah. that, then you can have the big boppers coming in and maybe have two guys on base hit a three-run bomb here and there. But build some innings where you just keep the line moving. Yeah. Keep it moving. Mm-hmm. Get them stealing, hitting and running. Can't hit and run if you're not making contact. Right. You know, if you have no well, barrel control. You know, Mark, you're also talking about that's not a sexy, right? Yeah, you're right. Style of baseball. Well, yeah. So, well, because the home runs pay the bills, we right? Pay for so the yeah, do they? Now. Well, I guess in today's they? game. I think it's a mindset. I don't agree with that. You know, I, I think the home runs will come. You get guys on base. You put pressure on, on that guy in the middle yeah. of the, on the right. diamond. You're going to start getting better pitches to hit when he's under duress that's right right and on consistently mm-hmm. and I, I i i was that guy i gave up 522 of them you know i was under a lot of duress right and i'm not proud of it but i did it right but i had opportunity but as with that opportunity i got better and better and better with it right but yeah i mean mark just described it you know that's that's a wonderful way you know but now you have to build your major league club to that mm-hmm. You got to have your that mindset in AAA and possibly even in a double A, uh, and you have to have those skill sets, and right. you got to spend time with it. You know, I mean, you look at you look at the you know you brought up the Cardinals. You know, you go to to, uh, to St. Louis, and at three o'clock they might be hitting early, but at three thirty they've got all the infielders out, and they're I mean these guys are grinding with right. ground balls and turning double plays and. You know, they're in shorts and T-shirts. The gates aren't open. And, they're and you know, you wonder why the Cardinals, I know, and I know that in the areas that I played in, they were always good defensively because they, that was a fundamental that they felt was part of who they were, right? And I know back, you know, before I was in the American League, the Oriole way was that way, you know, when, uh, when Mr. Ripken was basically running that organization, um as far as on field stuff and you know there was a there was the, the oriole way you heard always heard about the oriole way you know and you'd like to see teams have their way right because i think now it's the home run, the way is the home run and you know but i will commend the mariners you know they're starting pitching this year oh my god it's been phenomenal historic can they maintain it i hope so right can they and then can, if they can do it this year can they build off of it for the next year and the next year that's that's when you see the effectiveness with it, right? Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know. I, the the Kingdom and and Safeco are two totally different ballparks. I, I mean, I can't imagine two totally different ballparks than those two. I mean, maybe Minnesota when they when they got rid of the Metrodome, but I mean, the the, the, the playing surface in the Kingdom was hard. It was <laughs> it was fast. The fences were in. I mean, it was a hitter's park for the most part. I mean, there were some pitchers that had success there, but it was a hitter's ballpark. He gave you confidence at the plate. Um, and then Safeco was, I mean, immediately you you noticed it was it was the ball didn't go as far. It's a bigger yard, but it was beautiful. It was comfortable. The clubhouse was excellent. I mean, every everything about it that I remember was was excellent. And, and I, and I didn't, I didn't really, it didn't really bother me because I wasn't a, I wasn't a big hitter anyway. I mean, I was more of a defensive guy. So the home plate was fine. <laughs> that area was fine for me. Um, it, it didn't bother me much, but I know there were a lot of guys that, especially that first year and, and we moved in in July, 
were complaining about the batter's eye and they complained about the ball wasn't going anywhere to left. And there was all kinds of things that people were saying and, and they, and they, they might've been true, but um, there were, there were probably some kinks to work out there that I think they did work out after that first year that they made changes on the second year. But no, for me, it, it, it was even as big of a change as it was, it didn't, it didn't really affect me much as a, as a catcher. So when you, when you were taking ABs, did you notice the batter's eye at all? Were you having uh, trouble? I, I, for me, where I stood, uh, I had never had an issue with picking the ball up. Even when they said they, 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 they painted it one, one time, I think we got there, it was green and then they painted it dark and I never had an issue with it, but you know, they're looking at it from a different side of the plate than I am. So it was a little different, you know, depending where the sun, if the sun was shining that day, it, it would be different for a left-hander than it would be for a right-hander. So um, I never had any problems with, with the kingdom or with Safeco batter's eye or anything okay. about it. Yeah. It's been a big complaint from players recently. So we'll see really? if they do anything to change it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, like the angle of the batter's eye isn't flat. It goes in a certain direction. Yeah, it's angled. It, hitters are always looking for an excuse. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like yep. Teoscar Hernandez. He was with the Mariners last right. year for a year. And you look at his home and away splits, and it's insanely bad at home compared to, to away. And then he goes to L.A., and now he's having back to his career norms, like slugging like well, crazy. I still think hitters go in there, and they feel like they have to swing harder. Right. And we all know that when you try to do more, it does not come out the same. It's that effortless just movement but you know that it packs a punch and Adrian Beltre prime example in 2009, his last year with Seattle, he probably flew out 20 times with the warning track in left field. And he'd come into the clubhouse. I hate this place. I hate hitting here. This is terrible. He ended up going to Boston the next year and hitting 40 something homers and then signs with Texas and continues. So I think it just gets in your head when you can't put the ball over the wall and that's what you're paid to do. And it doesn't happen. And it just, it buries you instead of just taking what you're given, put a good swing on it. Hopefully it goes out, but line drives turn into home runs, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You go for homers. You're going to strike out a lot. Getting away from the baseball side of it a little bit and more to like the human side of it and the mindset of the grind of baseball and the minor leagues and getting to the major leagues. There's a concept, the gap and the gain that I've heard of recently to where the gap is where you're focusing on where you're currently at to where you want to be versus the gain is where you're focusing on where you're currently at compared to how far you've come. So throughout your careers, you know, how, how did you manage your mindset and stay level headed with everything, trying to get through the grind of baseball with it's a game of failure? Yeah, I don't know. I've never heard those terminologies before. <laughs> They're, they're coming up with all yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, The Gap I, in the Game is just a book that I read. I, you know, oh, to okay. me, it's, yeah. we played the game. Right. And you dealt with whatever happened, whether you won as a team or you lost as a team, whether you were 0 for 4 or 4 for 4 or pitched seven innings or pitched one inning. Uh, it was like, okay, how do I get better? Right? And there wasn't, I know, you know, back in the years, there weren't a club's top 10 prospects you just played mm -hmm. right i didn't expect to be in the big leagues in two years of service time in the minor leagues i had no idea and when i got called up i was flabbergasted i'm like i'm not even close to being in the big leagues but i was in a pitching thin organization the cubs and i followed steve engel through the organization and he went to the big leagues and i went to triple a and then they sent him down and i got called up i mean it, it, it happened like that so mm -hmm. to me that i again What's the the phrase uh, paralysis by analysis? You know, I think it can, in today's game, it can be pointed at in a lot of different areas. It's the game, play the game of baseball. Between the lines, there's a lot of communication or lack of communication or too much knowledge, information out there. But you got, as a pitcher, you got to pitch. As a catcher, you got to call a game. As a hitter, you got to hit, right? And as a hitter, you try to hit to the situations. I mean, those things will never change. Right. But it's what, what is my mindset to the game? If I'm just thinking about hitting home runs, well, then, boy, I'm going to be backed in, I'm going to pigeonholed into a corner at some point because I'm facing all these big arms. Right. Yeah. How do you, how do you adjust to that? I, that's the part I don't get. You know, I mean, it's as Mark was saying, put the ball in play, use your legs, hit and run, put pressure in the defense. 
that's a whole different, and that's uh, you know what I saw in the minor leagues. You know, going back to your question, that's what I saw in the minor leagues. That's what we worked on in the minor leagues. That's bunting, right? There's you know, get a guy on, you bunt him over. If you're at the bottom of the order, you're bunting him over, mm-hmm. right? That's just how it was. Get a guy in scoring position. Now we got two chances to get that guy in, and you never know what can happen between there, right? You turn it into a big inning, you put pressure on the defense. But if you're just sitting back and waiting for the punch out or the home run, boy, it's and but we're speeding up the game because there's less time, you know, you, you don't get as many warm up pitches and there's less time between the innings and there's less time between pitches. Okay, but we've lost the art of the game here somewhere. So how do we find again, going back to that where where's the happy medium in the middle? Sorry well, about the rant. What well, no. what was the tar- the phrase again? I'm gonna the see gap I- in the gain. The gap in the gain, and what was the first part? So the gap. You want me to explain? Like the yeah. gap. So the gap is you focusing. Like it's all about staying in the gain so that you stay level headed and that you're thinking more positive instead of okay. pessimistic. So the gap is where you're thinking about where you currently are to where you wish you were, versus okay. the gain is where you currently are to you know how far you've come. Yeah. So looking at how far you've come and the progress that you've made compared to why am I not there yet? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that mentality happens a lot in AAA, especially with guys that have been up and then they go down. I think it's very easy to get caught up in, well, what's so-and-so doing, you know, up in the big leagues, I'm right. playing better than him here and he's up there. And so it's all these things that you have zero control over other than just putting your nose in the ground and putting the work in. Mm-hmm. And then just let everything else develop, you know. That's and, where, and that's where the mistake is made. Yeah, when you're thinking about what he what he's that's doing, exactly right. Instead of focusing on what you should be doing. Yes, exactly. right. And that's right, you know. And I I just think that control the I say it all the time to the kids that I coach. Control the controllable. There's so many things that are out of your control in this game. You control the effort you put in, <clears throat> being on time, how you treat your teammates, how you treat the umpires, your competition. All that stuff. That's the stuff you have control of. You don't have control over hardly anything else that happens in this game. And I just think that if you're able to control the controllable in the game of baseball, good things are going to happen. But you have to be willing to put the work in. And you're going to continue to progress down the road and get to where you want to. And if you don't, you're going to be pretty far down the road that nobody else has even seen Mm -hmm. if you come up a little bit short. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... don't I don't, and I, I, I wasn't meaning to get on you when I asked that question. I, I've just never, I've never thought about that. I don't think I've ever thought about that. Maybe I did when I was in the minor leagues. I could see myself maybe at saying at some point, "Gosh, this is where I need to be." And you know, we spent a lot of time in the big leagues, which, I mean, couldn't ask for a better situation. But, um, yeah, I, I've, I've always been the only thing I can control is myself. You know, you can control your attitude, how hard you work. I mean, that's one thing that I can control. I can't control anything else. So I guess I never really spent much time thinking about those things. You know, I I, I don't, I imagine we could probably come up with a conversation, you know, about it. But I, I off the top of my head, I just, I, I never thought about that. And I don't think, I, I still don't think about that. Only, only thing I'd. I, I, I could even possibly imagine just, just trying to stay within yourself. How many times have you heard that in the freaking game? Stay within yourself. Just do what you can do. Control what you can control. So to compare so you're talking about where you where you where you were and where you are now. To me that's too variable. Because your opinion of that, if you're an evaluator, and my opinion of that might be two different opinions. Mm-hmm. Right? And Really, it's going to come down to the evaluator or, you know, the organization who's about your manager, your pitching coach, your hitting coach, your general manager, your scouting director, whatever it might be. So they can make it whatever they want it to be, even though you, you, there might be, you have made your gains, but again, it's just an opinion. It's somebody's opinion. Like it's always been right. When you get called up, it's you're, you're getting called up because it's, a conglomerate of people's opinion or one person's opinion that has the biggest opinion, right? Oh, we're going to call you up today. Well, why? My first question, why? Not that I don't want to be there, but why? What did I do to get here? Mm -hmm. Right? 
And then what are your expectations? Well, that's, you know, to me, that's an open-ended question too, because we can say, well, we want you to do this and this and this. Well, I'm not, you're asking me to do something I'm, that I'm not capable of doing. Yeah, but we want you to do that. You know, so to me, it, again, it all comes down to who are, who am I? What do I bring? What do I bring to the table? What does he bring to the table? And what does he bring to the table? And if we all bring what we can bring to the table, that's what I have, the commonality that I've noticed on the few teams that I've been on that have won or being on a World Series team, everybody's bringing something to that table. And there, and, and, and the difference is it's, it's, it's honest, it's true, it's hardworking, and we're all holding each other accountable, maybe not verbally all the time, but what I see in him and what I see in him I I need to get better. Or if I'm in a rotation of five guys and this guy pitches well and that guy pitches well, well I want to pitch just as good, if not better. And then I want, you know, hoping the next guy feels the same way. And then, you know, and then you go through a couple of turns and all of a sudden, you know, you're building off of that. Maybe your team follows that energy and, and, and that vibe, right? You've all played on teams where if there's a particularly on probably when Felix was pitching mm -hmm. in your day, Oh, well, it's Felix's day. We're going to win. You know, guys walk in the clubhouse with a little more bounce in their step. We're going to win today. Randy Johnson. Yeah. You know, no, I play with Nolan Ryan. Oh, Noli's pitching today. Oh, oh we're going to win. Sure. Right. And there's guys on the other team going, there's a handful of guys going, I'm getting a day off because they know they're getting, a, you know, they're not going to face that guy. Right. So, I mean, again, it's, it's a lot going on up here in this game. And I yeah. think, again, you've made so many wonderful points today about the simplicity and keeping things, you know, simple. I, and I, I you know, we always tried to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't always work. No. Right. And then it's a, well, what can I do different? What can, well, why do I have to be different? You know, I alluded to it earlier. What got me to the big leagues? Yeah. I have to fine tune things. I have to get a little bit better here and there, maybe mechanically, re, you know, repeating mechanics or my location or the, the variance of speeds or hitting the ball the other way or, you know, hitting the ball in the air with a man on third base with less than two out, you know, things like that, you know, getting ahead in the count as a hitter. I mean, there's things that within us that we all can do to bring to the table to make that group, the whole group better. That's what happens on winning teams. Exactly. Everybody buys into that. And and there's the egos are all checked That's in. Exactly the right. That's exactly right. And I guess another word for it would be, you know, being present. Because the reasoning for the question is, you know, in today's day and age with social media and constant comparison, and you're thinking of people are, are not as present as they maybe should be. And so I assume that a strength that everyone in here has is that you're able to be present and in the moment and focusing on the task at hand instead of thinking of, you know, what you wish you were doing instead. So that's well, you know, for me, in, in the course of a game, the thought of being present, how many times have you been in a dugout and you look around and there's two people in the dugout? Mm. You're like, where is everybody? Right. Oh, they're in the video room watching videos. Oh, but there's a game going on right here. That's where you're getting your feel for the day. Right. Well, I want to go in and see what that pitch was. I want to see if the umpire missed that call. That's behind you, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're aren't you pulling for these guys, mm -hmm. right? And I I've been on you know several teams that uh, at at certain points of the year maybe when we're not doing well, video rooms off limits. But now that you know they have iPads on the bench, but even still, the feel, the tempo, the rhythm, what's going on out there, right? Let's play for today, and let's play for today as a group. You know, guys are in the clubhouse getting food or you know relaxing. Right. Eh, you know what? The game's now two plus hours. I think you can give two plus hours to be focused out here with your teammates, right? And I, you know, teams know that teams know what, you know, managers are smart. They know who's going in, who's going out, how long guys are in the clubhouse. You know I mean? And that's, that's a hard part of, I think of managing, you know, watching managers, you know, they see guys going in, they might have to chase, you know, we, we had at one point we had to like a, like a little uh, eraser that we had to take. It's like when you're in school, going to the bathroom, you take the ruler to the bathroom and come back and put it on the, 
on the teacher's desk because <laughs> guys were fooling around in the clubhouse. Really? Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, we should be out here. I'm guessing so, that wasn't a winning team. No. Well, and that's what happens when you don't win. Yeah. Right? Too many other exactly distractions. Right. And not everybody's on the same page. So, I mean, but, you know, each team knows if they're in that space or not in that space. Right? But it's it's something that I'm sure you've you've witnessed it and seen it as well. Mm-hmm. And I think we've all been culprits of it. For sure. You know? I can admit it. I've, yeah. I've been a culprit. And, hey, get your, get your butt out on the bench. Right. Right? Well, I think we talked about it on a previous podcast. Like, for me, work ethic-wise, in my mind, I felt like I never belonged every step of the way. My whole life, I never felt like I was good enough to be here. So even in a major league clubhouse, year seven or eight, I still felt like I never belonged. But that pushed me. That pushed me to get more out of myself every single day. I pulled in into my parking spot, and I was super thankful for that opportunity to step out of my car and walk in down the same path that I do every day to my locker and I get up and there's my name with the major league logo and my jerseys in my locker. Like I was thankful for that, but still never felt like I belonged. but I had to have that in order to keep moving because the second, because I know my personality, the second I feel like I've made it, I pump mm-hmm. the brakes. I pump the brakes and the game will always humble you and let you know that you're not even close. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very valid point. And I, I'm going to add to that. Every year in spring training, I felt like I needed to make the team. Every year I played. I didn't care if I had a couple-year contract. I had a, If I had to make the team, I went with a mindset, I need to make this team. And I think that same thing. I don't want to let my guard down. Because as soon as I let my guard down, things are going to get sloppy. Yeah. So that was the way I approached it. Um, you know, I remember you in spring training. In, it had to be 06 because you weren't there in 07. He was on the elliptical. How many years do you have in an 06? 15. <laughs> and he's on the elliptical. I think you got done. I think it was after a game. And you're in that back room in Seattle in the weight room. Mm-hmm. That little tiny room where they do like the little ball that they roll mm-hmm. to each other. And he's just pouring sweat. You got a towel around your neck, just dripping sweat. And one of the strength coaches is like, Jamie, what are you doing, man? He goes, just showing these kids what hard work is in case any of them want to take my job one day till then I'll just keep moving. (laughs) And I never forgot that. And I'm like, this guy's been playing forever. And like, look at the work ethic that he still has. Like he's, you made plenty of money to live off of, but that's he, you wanted more. And so I never lost sight of watching guys like that. I'm like, if, if they're able to do that this deep into their career that I should never have an excuse to stop working. And I learned that, Mm -hmm. From players that I played with when I was younger. Yeah. Watching them. That's right. And, then, and that's what you pass along. Right? It's not, doesn't always have to be verbal. It can be visual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So pretty, so personal. Like I appreciated that. And I appreciated watching you do your <laughs> thing. And then also watching you throw your bullpens. Like, since I was young, a rookie when, when he was with us. And we'd all get down there and watch his pins warming up. And I'm sure you could probably vouch for this. You probably just took a nap. And he's like, all right, here comes a fastball. Oh, there it is. Well, it wasn't only that. It was how many pitches he threw to a certain spot. It was was there, Then he threw four there. Then it was four there. Then right there. Then it was here. Then it was breaking balls. Then it was change up. That's right. It was fastball in, fastball out. Flip the ball to the stands. No lock to the thing. I just, I remember it. I can almost remember it. Yeah. And nothing was above the knees. And he would ask the catcher, all right, a little bit lower. Boom. There it is. All right, a little lower. Boom. A little lower. Boom. And I'm sitting here looking at the guys going, I have no chance in this league. <laughs> like all the young guys, I'm like, they're like, you throw harder. I'm like, yeah, but if I could throw hard and do that. And so that was my goal. I was like, I, if he can do it, I mean, he's showing me that it's possible. So that should be my goal to try to be able to do that. Yeah, with but I what think I'm that given. the difference in that is the velocity today. You can't throw your bullpens like that. I mean, I throw 100, 120 pitch bullpens at 70, 80%. Yeah. I'd get after it, but you know, today they throw 20, 30 pitch bullpens and then they're done. Well, right. how my question is, I'm not saying it's poor, but how do you develop anything? Mm-hmm. You know, are you, are you repeat, learning how to repeat your mechanics? Are you feeling the ball come off your fingertips? Are you actually seeing where the ball's going? There's no hitter up there. You're not, there's no result from a hitter, but there's the result of a pitch. 
So to me, that repetitive mechanical part, you go in the cage. If you take 10 swings, say, all right, I'm going to go play. Yeah, you could play. But if you took your 50, 60, 80, 100 swings, whatever you normally took, you're ready to go, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Right? So it's, and then, and that exudes confidence as well, you know? And, and for me as a pitcher, when I was having a bad bullpen, I hated it. And I get angry and I'd, and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd keep going and I'd keep going. I'd, I'd work it out. Right. And that's just how it, yeah. that's how I learned. Right. And I took a ton of lumps and there were times I stunk. Right. But we all do, but you have that belief. Well, I know I have the foundation. I've laid the foundation for what I need. And I know who I am. I'm not trying to be Mark Lowe. Right. I'm not trying to be Felix Hernandez. I'm not trying to be Randy Johnson. I need to be Jamie. Too. And who is Jamie? And that's what I do. Right. And I think that's what we all need to, you know, players need to understand. So you'd throw 120 p uh, pitch bullpens between easily, starts? Easily. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I, mechanically, you were sound. So you could do that. Not all the time, but You're yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. But I mean, towards the end of my career, I'd, you know, my pitching coach would go off. He'd be like, hey, you know, you need to cut back. And I'd say, you know what? You kick me out of here. I'm going to take a bag of balls and I'll go in the parking lot and I'll find some way to finish my bullpen in the parking lot. I just, you know, it's, or if, you know, I'll go throw against the wall. There were many days before starts, I'd go out in the outfield and I didn't throw hard, but I was working on mechanics, working on release point, even though it was flat ground, just working on things, right? It's all that touchy feely kind of stuff, right? Well, if you could do it, if you could go deep into a bullpen and you're tired and mechanically you can stick inside your mechanics when you're tired, it should be no problem on game day right. when you have 100 pitches. Well, let's say 180 after warming up and right. in between innings. And then that side day, I got all my cardio in and I got all my lifting in. Yeah. My, my leg day was that day as well. So I'd be loose going to the bullpen. I didn't have to get loose in the bullpen. So, and I wanted to be tired. Yeah, because I wanted, you know, the expectation was we want you to pitch seven, eight, nine innings. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be looking in the dugout going, I need help. Right. Right. So how do you pitch when you're tired? Right. And, you know, there's 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 a mental fatigue and there's a physical fatigue. Yeah. I think. Yeah. There's Especially a, with yeah. the starting pitcher, but I'm sure with the relief pitcher, it's it's a fatigue, but it might be a different type of fatigue. Yeah. I mean, it, just the day, day after day after day. Yep. Um, I ended up coming up. I took Eddie Guardado's spot in mm -hmm. Seattle. Um, and he called me that day and congratulated me. And I never forgot that. I was like, his nickname was Everyday Eddie. Mm -hmm. And I I loved it. And I was like, you know what? If I'm going to take his spot on this team, that's my goal, is to be available every single day. And down the course, like down the stretch, I can't tell you how many days off I took. It You could count them on one hand. Um my last five or six, big, six years in the big leagues, but it was all preparation, what I did to prepare. And I figured out that if I just took care of myself and I worked out and I continued to condition and run and do my shoulder exercises religiously, like I can throw every day. And I long toss it, but I long mm -hmm. toss with older guys, Arthur Rhodes, mm -hmm. JJ Putts, all these guys that have put their time in Darren Oliver. I put myself around older guys because I wanted to see why they're pitching so late in their career and watch what they did. And I followed suit and it worked. Um, but then again, I had an old school mindset because I appreciated the game and, and the guys I was in the clubhouse with. And I don't know how much that exists today, but. Yeah. Do, do you guys remember certain players that mentored you when you were first coming up? And then also off of that, any managers that you really found helped you with that early growth um <clears throat> yeah there were a lot of players that uh that were influential in my early career uh, probably the first one that comes to mind was Corey snyder was was very influential to me when i got to cleveland i mean i i, I was drafted in 86 i got to i got to the big leagues in 88 and he just he was so nice to me. So, I mean, his wife was nice to my wife and that's a big part of it, right. To have our spouses accepted. And so that was, um, he was great kind of showing me the ropes on how to act, where to go, you know, what to do in spring training. Um, 
and there were, I mean, there were handfuls of guys after that, but, but I remember Corey being, um, just being a huge, a uh, huge influence in my early baseball career. And then there were coaches that Mike Hargrove was my, was my, uh, I think Grover's last year was 85. And then in 86, he was a hitting coach in Batavia, which was my rookie ball club in the, in New York Penn league. And again, him and Sharon or Sharon was great with Lori and Mike was, I mean, here I am a, a, a kid, you know, like Mark was saying, you, you don't even feel like you belong there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm now halfway across the, I'm across the country in Genesee, New York in the cornfields in a, in a, in, you know, in playing with 30 guys that half of them didn't speak English. And I, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody. And there were four catchers on the team. I'm like, yeah, well, they, somebody's going to have to move here. Right. I mean, I didn't know, and I didn't know the coaching staff, but, but I knew Mike Hargrove from watching him play and he was my hitting coach. And so that was, that was comforting to know that there was a guy there that, that took a serious interest in me and his wife, a serious interest in my, my wife and my kids. So uh, eventually my kids. So <clears throat> I would say probably those two earlier are two that I remember, um, were very, uh, had a big impact on me early on. I think for me, um, just coming up. So Eddie and JJ were throwing partners. Well, typically what happens is one guy goes, you fill in and that's your throwing partner. Um, so our first day playing catch, he's got this ball just loaded up with pine tar. Like it's like the color of this table. And I'm going, he throws it to me and I'm going, what am I supposed to do with this thing? He goes, you better get used to it, man. These balls are slick. There's no seams on them. So he goes, it'll stay on your hands for the rest of the night. And it's not too sticky, but it gives you a little bit of tack. And so I ran with that for the rest of my career. That was one first day in. I was like, hmm. I mean, I don't even care if everybody knows about it now. You know, can't take it back. It's all in the books. Uh, but that that helped me not for not for like making my stuff better, but just for feel, making sure that those balls are slick and just to protect guys. Um, that was one thing and just work ethic. One thing he always told me was just have a plan before you get to the park every single day. When you're driving in, in your mind, go through your day. What do you want to accomplish? What do you need to do to prepare? And I never forgot that um and really kind of pushed throughout my whole career with that idea knowing exactly what i have to do and making sure that i don't take a day off from fulfilling that plan and ch checking every single box on that list um so he was a great mentor and then manager wise one of the biggest moments of my career we had uh john mclaren was our manager in 2008 in seattle and I was still young coming up. I came up in 06, 07, I was hurt, had an elbow surgery. And then 2008, I made the club out of spring and just going up and down, like good days, bad days, good days, bad days. But he could see me putting the pressure on myself. Max, great. And He's he called great. me in his office one day and I'm like, all right, I'm getting sent down. Here we go. I sit on his couch and he looks at me in the eyes and he says, you're a really good pitcher. And he goes, but I also see you putting pressure on yourself right now. He goes, I want you to know that I'm going to fight for you to stay here tooth and nail so that you don't leave. You're going to go through the struggles. You're going to go through the failures and you're going to go through the successes this whole year and you're not going anywhere. And he goes, and I want you to commit to that right now before you walk out of this room. And I said, I'm all in. And that changed my career because that gave me comfort yeah. that a manager had my back and I didn't have to look over my shoulder when I failed and for the rest of my career, I just rode that. But if it wasn't for that moment, I don't know where it would have gone. I, I could have been derailed easy because you're playing on the, the biggest stage in the entire world in baseball. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to look back and go, oh, I gave up six today. I'm going to be gone tomorrow. And then if that doesn't happen, you come into the field the next day, but you're not ready because you're thinking about something that you had no control over. You know, So it just mm -hmm. gave me comfort and just understand that you have – things you have to do regardless of what's going on after today, but flush today, whether it's good or bad, come in tomorrow, the sun went down, came back up, you've got a new day. And that was just kind of how I went about every single day from there on out. So that was a big moment in my career. Yeah. I think for me, almost every coach, pitching coach, manager, and even sometimes, you know, instructors, you know, hitting instructors, pitching instructors, 
everybody had some sort of impression on me. You know, I can remember my first pitching coach, Bill Ballou, in Geneva, New York, you know, having an impression. My first manager, Tony Franklin, little fiery, feisty guy. You know, you, you, you learn some of the do's and don'ts real quick when you get into pro ball. You know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. You watch by other people making mistakes and them getting kind of leaned on and, you know, led in the right direction. So to me, it's, you know, you being able to use your eyes and your ears. Uh, but you know, when I get to double A, uh, I mean, I had Rick Kranitz in my first full season in A-ball. He had just been re released, I believe, by the Brewers. He was a first-year pitching coach. He's been in the big leagues for probably 15, 20 years, right? Um, you know, Dick Pohl was a very influential for me in the minor leagues and then had him a little bit in the big leagues with the Cubs. We're still friends. Um, you know, but I, every, every pitching coach I've had has had some sort of influence. And as I got older, what I started to learn was the more I could open up and allow that person to – understand me or understand what I'm thinking and feeling that that open that communication was wide open I could say anything I wanted to them and they could say anything to me neither of us got offended where early in my career I might have gotten offended by some of those things right because you're judging me or you know it, it's it, I didn't never looked at it as a judgment I looked at it as criticism positive or negative I don't care I'll take it because I'm trying to get better up until my last pitch, I'm trying to get better. And I think having that mindset, and again, I learned that Rick Sutcliffe and Scott Sanderson were probably the first two guys in the big leagues that kind of took me under their wing on the field, off the field. Um, but I mean, you know, having teammates like, you know, and, you know, some of these are no brainers, you know, they were in the last time I was on with you, you know, Nolan Ryan, he was a great pitcher, but it's not just because he was a great pitcher. It's because of who he was off the field, how he treated me, what he did in the weight room, what he did running-wise, what he did playing catch. I watched that guy like he was my twin, right? And I did that with a lot. Charlie, play with Charlie Huff. You know, well, he threw a knuckleball. It doesn't matter. It's what's it's what's coming out of here. What's, you know, I mean, it's that that's the kind of stuff I became a sponge to. Um, and I mean, I could, I could give you a laundry list of those players. And then, you know, there's some people you just don't quite get along with, but you can still learn from them. and their teammates or their coaches. So you got to be respectful of that. Right. But even though I don't like you or agree, doesn't mean I dislike you as a human being, but I just, maybe I don't agree with what you're, what you're doing, but I do respect who you are as a, as a person and as a player. And I, you know, I think Along that those lines, there's so many things that I was able to experiment with. And well, that didn't work, but part of it worked. So I'm gonna hold on to that. And you know, and as you know, I continued to play, I I, you know, had a lot of experience. You know, Stan Williams, you brought him up earlier. I mean, I don't I don't ever remember seeing him pitch when I was a young kid, mm -hmm. but I've heard tons of stories about him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we had him as a pitching coach. I I had loved him. He was different, right? Mm -hmm. And he and he was all about having fun and all that, but he was also serious. Mm -hmm. And he came from a really old school mm -hmm. style of baseball. So there were some things that he brought to me that really kind of stuck, right? Mm -hmm. But then he would also say, hey, "You got to be goofy. You got to be goofy." I'm like, "What?" You know, but how do you how do you describe goofy, right? You know, and, and you, you know, you get to the point where you'd say when you're on the mound, you want people to like think, is he going to throw the ball at me or is he going to, you know, that's what you, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's fear, but you're, you're, you want the, the hitter on eggshells. Mm -hmm. In the same light, when you were nearing the end of your careers, were, were there certain guys that you took under your wing and that you kind of mentored yourself? Um, well, end of my career, well, excluding my last year in San Diego, my, my last three of my last four years were in Seattle. And I mean, we had a pretty old club there. I wasn't going to take him under my wing, <laughs> um, you know, or, or Edgar or Jay or, you know, Booney or, you know, any of those guys, Ma uh, Mark McLemore, I mean, those guys, most, a lot of the guys that I played with in Seattle were all, we were all 10 year plus guys. I mean, there was a lot of older guys on that team. But I would say 
Um, the last year in San Diego, uh, we had a lot of young guys on that team and I was the oldest guy on the team. Although, you know, we had some, you know, Trevor Hoffman and, and Phil Nevin and Ryan Klesko and Mark Kotze were on that club, Bobby Jones. Um, so we had a couple older guys, but a lot of the, um, pitchers that I was dealing with were younger. So Jake Peavy was there and there were a couple other ones that were, can't think of their names right offhand that were there that um that we were always talking to about and and it, it's more about just you know kind of share with them that hey you, they're, they're not going to make an adju- a judgment off you in one outing just go out there relax you got here for a reason you know trying to trying to give them some confidence encouragement to to pitch the way they can pitch and to do what they did that got them there instead of worry about the situation being too big for them because it can it can get like that <clears throat> sometimes um uh, Sean Burroughs um was there uh his his I believe that was his rookie year and <laughs> I'll never forget I was in my locker one day and I, I was in the, the very beginning of the season and I started the year one for 39 and Wiki Gonzalez had got hurt in the second game of the season so I I had to catch every day which I wasn't I mean, I, I was, I was okay. I was still in, you know, I shape to do it, but you know, I was 38 years old at that time. And, and I just, I wasn't ready to do that. I what my spring training really wasn't geared to start doing that. But anyway, nonetheless, um, I, I got off to a horrible start. And I remember Sean Burroughs came up to me one time. It was within the first few weeks of the season. And he, and he, he said, do you, uh, he goes, he goes, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, he goes, you, you like, know that you're not, like you're one for 39 right now. I mean, do you know that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, how, I mean, <laughs> how are you like doing it? I mean, how do you come to the yard? You get your work in. It's like, you know, you're still encouraging people. You're still in the meetings. You're still doing your film. And I said, well, I said, because, because this game doesn't, doesn't, it, I mean, my identity isn't in baseball. That's not who I am. You know, who I am is, is somebody else. And <clears throat> You know, he was struggling at the time, and I was like, you know, this this game can't be who what identifies you. You can't be that guy. You have to be Sean Burroughs, the person, you know, and not Sean Burroughs, the baseball player. And at some point, you'll get that. And I mean, he he he. We all know he he went through some rough times, and but he ended up getting his life back together. And and I love that kid. He was a great kid. Um, but but I think. If, if, if as older players, we can be that guy for some younger players, then, then it makes all, it makes it all worth it, especially your struggles. And I know, I know Jamie just from playing with him and and as long as he played, he probably ran into a lot of scenarios like that, where he got to mentor young kids. And I'm sure Mark did too. Um, And that's one of the greatest parts of our career, right? Is, is being able to try to impart some things on kids that they, they never thought that they that they would have to deal with those things. But those are the things that get us through the game, right? Those are the things that get us through the long stretches in the season when you're struggling and stuff like that. And that's a, I mean, if we can do that, then, I mean, I know for me that, that, that makes the game worth the worth going through all the struggles, being able to help kids like that, because it, it happened for me, guys helped me like that. And so, yeah, being there to pass that stuff on is, is priceless. I think um, knowing how I went about trying to get comfortable with talking to an older player, like that takes, first of all, it takes guts to walk up. And because it, when I was coming up, it was different. Like you're walking on eggshells. Like you're just trying to just do your job. Like we were talking the other day, don't be seen, don't be heard, just do your job on the field. That's it. Like that was my goal coming in. So it took a lot for me to go and sit next to guys like Arthur Rhodes and Darren Oliver and these older guys that have been around for 20 years, but I asked them questions. They didn't just open the book. And I think that that's the story you just told. He came to you. Mm -hmm. Sean came to you and asked you, how are you doing this? And I think that that's important when a young kid comes up and is willing to break the ice, become vulnerable, come to you and ask a question. Those are kids that want to learn. And those are kids that are going to make it. Um, I had Robbie Ross early on with Texas, and he did everything incorrect right out of the gates. Like, we had rules on stuff you could wear, did the opposite. Um, pink backpack, 
never packed with the stuff that was supposed to be in there. So we were always hammering them and we gave him a hard time about it, but it was like in a way that was useful for him later on in his career. And at the end of my career, he's with Boston and we kind of talked here and there, but he came up to me at the end of the game, the bullpens are right next to each other. So you kind of come out of the gates together and he tracked me down and he goes, Hey, I just want you to know that I appreciate everything you did for me as a young player and told me what I should do and what I should not do. And that has really carried me through my whole career. And you don't know that, that you have that effect on kids. Um, but if you're getting them to do stuff the right way and the way that I was taught by guys like you to have some respect for not only your teammates, but the other players you're playing against, you guys are the best on the planet, but don't lose sight of that. And what's on the back of your baseball card. Everybody knows that already. But who you are as a teammate, who you are as a person, that's what people remember about you. And I noticed that early on in my career when we, somebody's name would come up. You know, what was he like? It wasn't about his career. I was like, what kind of person was he? Good teammate, bad teammate? Right. The baseball stuff didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's it. you're exactly right. Like, your identity cannot be in the game of baseball because it's going to end one day. Mm -hmm. And what you leave behind is maybe something you told a kid that can carry him into the next phase of his life after baseball just by being a good person and, and treating people and talk to people with respect in the right way. Absolutely. Yeah. I took pride in mentoring, um, especially as a starting pitcher, you know, you're only going to pitch once every five days. So you got four, four days of watching baseball games. So you get the opportunity to sit beside whoever on the bench. And usually it was starting pitchers, but, Sometimes it might be a reliever early in the game. It might be a, a utility guy, uh, but it was mostly starting pitchers. But, you know, you could talk about what was going on in the field. You could talk about what they were doing. But for me, <clears throat> to try to help younger players, it was about, I want to see a fail. And I don't tell them that, but, you know, I'm telling you this, that I want to see a player fail because I want to see how he responds and reacts to failure, right? I, I know how they're going to respond to success, but how are they going to, how is failure going to affect them? And how long does it affect them, right? And do they change as people? Because I've seen it, and I was one of them. Early in my career, I was that knucklehead, right? Until I, you know, had to beat my head against the wall or have somebody grab me and say, hey, wait a minute, just go out and pitch, right? And when you start to learn that, um, and be able to share that, you know, and what I found was, you know, you start talking to a, a young, especially a starting pitcher and he's having nothing but success. They're not willing to listen because they're, they're already having, what are you going to tell me? You know, I've, I've pitched three or four really good games. You're right. I have nothing to tell you, but I do, I will share with you that you're going to fail. At some point you're going to fail. I don't know any player that's ever played the game that never, that struggled and, had a lot of failure. So it's learning, you know, and you're going to be in for a rude awakening. And then you all of a sudden see the flip side of it when they can't pick their chin up off the ground. And then they're coming to you, school, you know, oh, what do I do? What are you? Wait a minute. How were you when things were going well? Right? Were you not willing to listen? So here's now let's try to find a happy medium here. How do we deal with this? Right? And I want to respect you, but I want you to respect me. Right. And that you give that you, when you give respect, you get respect. And I think to me, that was the fun part of that, especially the older I got. Cause you know, I knew where I sat in the game and, or sat with the club and, you know, I knew my, my days were getting shorter and shorter, but to give back, to give back, to give back, to hold guys accountable or let's play catch tomorrow. Or let me come out, watch your bullpen or how about come out and watch my bullpen or let's work out in the weight room. Now, they're going to lift more weight than me, but it's what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of ways. You, and, and then it's also the mental side of the game. I think that's huge. As I think you had mentioned it, Tom. You know, this game is hugely mental, hugely mental. So how do I deal with that? And I think once you start to learn, you start to compartmentalize these things and work on each skill set individually, then I – that. To me, that's where you, you know, that growing, what was that terminology you used? Yeah, the gap of the, the gap yeah. in the game. 
that's where that gap can you know gets bigger, especially on the mental side. I think because we've all had it, we've all individually have had it, and we've all witnessed it happening to others, uh, either across the field or in our own clubhouse. And sometimes it's hard to watch because guys just want to beat themselves up, mm-hmm. right? And and it 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 they go they get deeper, and then you wonder if they're ever going to get out of it, right? Last question, and then we'll get you out of here. Um, transitioning from professional baseball to, you know, the rest of your your life, how was leaving baseball, transitioning out of baseball, and what have you been up to since then? Well, um, for me, the transition for me wasn't wasn't that bad. You know, I had, you know, I got my ten years in, which was uh, was was. A goal of mine, um, my my kids were getting to the point where they were starting to move on with their lives. You know, my oldest was starting to drive, um, my youngest was starting t-ball, uh, and another summer away, spring and summer away would have been tough for both of them. Um, and I was getting older, you know. I, I uh, you know, you start getting the aches and pains, and and so I, I might have been able to play a couple more years, but I didn't. I didn't, I mean, there were other things that I think were more important for me at that time. So the transition wasn't difficult for me. Um, I, I took a few years off and didn't do anything because I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, I think I was ready to get out of, of baseball, but I, I, I didn't think I wanted to get back into coaching. I didn't, at least at the, at the pro level, I didn't want to, I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to go back to the minor leagues. Um, and I didn't want, I didn't want to be gone from, you know, February to October. So, uh, coaching wasn't really an option for me. Um, at least pro ball, I, I thought maybe something at the lower level with the kids would be great, especially since I had young kids and my kids had friends that, you know, were all in sports. So I think that was something that I thought about, but, um, I just took a few years and didn't do much. And then, uh, turned out that, um, I started getting into hunting a lot more, um, towards the latter part of my career and all my hunting buddies were, were contractors. And so in order for them to come out and play, they had to finish their work. So I had to help them finish their work. So that's how I kind of got into, to contracting and then ended up being a general contractor for about, about 15 years. And, um, and I loved it. I, I loved it until, uh, until I started getting into more farming stuff. And now I love that. So, <laughs> uh, I just love being outside and working. I've, I've always been a worker. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not, I feel like I'm not doing anything if I'm not doing something productive. So I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, I try to stay busy that way, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit, but, uh, I still get out there. I still enjoy being outside and working. That's awesome. Staying active. Yeah. My transition was easy too. um, finally signed like a multi-year deal at the very end of my career and pitched terrible the first year of it. And then went into spring training in Detroit my second year and they let me go in spring training, came back home, stayed in shape in an adult wood bat league here, um, played in that and went to spring training, got let go again, went back, got ready again, went independent league and I was there for a couple months. My kids are growing up and, um, FaceTiming and, you know, talking about, what do you want to do when you guys are older? And my daughter's like, I don't know yet. My son's like, not a baseball player. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Well, why not? And he goes, because I don't want to be away from my family all the time. And so that stuck a knife right in my heart. And I was like, I'm missing out. And it, it for me to even make it back was, I mean, would be a miracle. You know, I was backing up third base every fourth pitch in indie ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the writing was on the wall. I always said that I wouldn't. I would have to have an injury to, to walk away. And that never happened. So the flip side of that is I walked away, my arm's still intact. I can still throw, I can still play catch with my son and, you know, his teammates and he's still sitting 90 with the pickles all-star. Yeah. 89, 92 last time out yeah. <laughs> and a bomb. <laughs> there you go. That. I saw the scouts in the crowd. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. 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 I haven't got any calls yet. <laughs> um, so same thing. I went a couple of years and I did, nothing except for catch up on lost time with my family and it's like a full-time landscaper at my house just mowed 
and just it, it gave me so i what i find on the mower is i find time it's like therapy because now you can just sit there there's no distractions and you can just think about all the things you've accomplished all the things you've learned all the things that you want to pass down all the things you're proud of all the things that you're embarrassed of you know and and i went through that for two years and i basically told my wife i was, said let me take everything for the next however long because you've done everything up to this point like every time we went somewhere Every time I got released, traded, she was packing the car and the kids and I was already gone. You know, then they're driving across the country or shipping the car and just dealing with all that. And as a player, you know, if you don't have that, like, I don't even know how you make it, yeah. like personally. Um, and so she was my rock through the whole thing. And there was times at the end of my career, I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And she talked me off a ledge and said, hey, just go to bed, come up tomorrow and see how you feel and sure thing i wake up and it was over and i go to the field and everything was different the next day um so i did that and then an opportunity came up here to start a baseball facility and been doing that for just over a year now and just coaching my son and he we started a little club team for him this last summer we're going to continue rolling that this year he just finally decided that he loves baseball and I never wanted to push that on him. <laughs> it was like, we'll try everything, and then you tell me what you want to do. And then after Little League this year, he just said, Dad, I want to keep going. I can't. Why is Little League ending and the weather's perfect here? So that's a good that's a good question. So we started that, and he got rolling and just fell in love with it. Um, so it's fun to watch that and watch him put the work in and give him pieces of advice but also understanding that he's eight years old not to get too carried away with it. And also his buddies and friends that are on the team. Um, but also giving lessons to kids, you know, from eight years old to kids in college, giving them pieces of advice and things that I've learned along the way that I wish that I had, you know, so I didn't have to fail as much as I did and dig myself out of the, out of the grave, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's been fun. I get, I get a lot of joy out of coaching kids and, um, if I can help them in any way, then that brings me a ton of gratitude each and every day. So that's kind of where I'm at right now, just doing that and giving lessons and coaching these boys. Transition for me was a little different. I was a little bit older. Um, golly, I had kids in college when I retired. So, you know, catching up with that part of life with them. Um, and then I had kids in high school and then we had kids in elementary school. So, I mean, I was in, you know, it was almost like when I was in my thirties and forty or thirties. Um, and now I've got two in college, two in high school and two granddaughters and a granddaughter on the way. So, I mean, it's, that's basically been keeping me busy. I play a little bit of golf and we've got four rescue dogs and just enjoying life up here in the PNW. Awesome. Well, uh, re really appreciate you. Appreciate the time that you guys yeah. all took to come out here and, yeah. and have this conversation. Love it. Looking forward to the next one. And yeah, thank you all again. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us, us, man. Sweet. Thank you. Out to center. This is great. It's way back.